Station. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try. Hello and, and welcome to Call to Action, the go to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, advertising, and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp and I'm Giles Edwards. Today I've caught Orlando Wood, the creative super brain and chief innovation officer of System One Group, Orlando is dead set on delving deep into the links between advertising, psychology and the creative arts. His books Lemon and Look Out dig into the change in creative style in today's technologically disrupted world and, importantly, what that's done to advertising effectiveness. Orlando says, Now, more than ever, we need advertising with wit and charm. Advertising with human vitality. Advertising that entertains. And in a world full of fear, anxiety and detachment, what could be more wonderful? Welcome to the show, Orlando. Hello, Giles. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. I love that quote, Orlando. Thank you. That's how you close one of your talks. It's beautiful. It is. Right, we've, we've got our seven quick fire questions. Tea or coffee? Tea. Peter Shilton or David Seaman? Oh, Peter Shilton, childhood hero. Piano or painting? Oh, difficult. Oh, that's hard. Um, piano. I thought you were going to say painting pianos there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> double jeopardy or triple jeopardy? Oh, funny. Triple. Triple. Number five, a look or a stare? A look. Right, water-based ads now. Guinness Surfer. Or Heineken's Water in Majorca. Water in Majorca, absolutely no contest for me. <laughs> and then lastly, which is the greater myth? The Loch Ness Monster or Advertising Wear Out? Oh, well, I guess uh, I guess it's, it's probably the Loch Ness Monster, but I, it could be Advertising Wear Out too. That's a tricky one. You really got <laughs> me on that last one. Um, yeah, I think ads don't wear out as quickly as we often think they, uh, they do. Um, but uh, yeah, no. uh, well, the thing is, you have ev- you have evidence to back that up. That's true. Whereas that's the true. evidence for the Loch Ness is slightly more ambiguous. Would suggest. Yeah, slightly more circumspect. <laughs> yeah, slightly. Yeah. So, Orlando, thanks again for joining us. We always start the show by celebrating the often weird and often wonderful ways that guests have ended up in the career they're in now. So, if we go back to the start, what was your first ever job, and then what was your first proper advertising-related job? Well, I, I suppose my the, my first paid uh, job was as um, I, I was a student. I studied French and German. I was in Paris, and I got a job um, doing interviews on the Eurostar. So unsuspecting passengers would be, uh, you know, sort of would catch my eye as I walked through the train, and I'd ask them for about an hour and a half. Those that took pity on me. Um, lots of questions about their experience. So I, it was kind of an early taste of, of market research, I suppose. Um, and then uh, I kind of, how did I, I suppose that the, the first salary, proper salary job was doing um, some work after I left uh, university. I did a, I did a master's in um, French, 17th century French literature, looking at changes in the style of poetry, I suppose, and changes in culture over a long period of time in the 17th century through the lens of a a lesser known chronicler and uh, scurrilous stories, gossip, that kind of thing. It occurred to me later, of course, that this is what I ended up doing in advertising. Um, But yeah, I kind of, uh, when I left university, I I worked briefly for a, well, for an organization called the Birmingham Marketing Partnership. I'm from Birmingham. You may not know that uh and i uh it was one of the, probably one of the it required the skills really of bill burnback looking back at it um but my role really there was was simply as a translator for the birmingham christmas markets because the frankfurt christmas market came over 
to Birmingham every uh, every year, and um, I was translating all sorts of strange things uh, for the for the guys on the market. So, so yes, that was that, that was my first uh, sort of salary job, and then I I got into uh, marketing and and well market research in particular, and uh, and gradually through really new product development research, I ended up finding my way towards advertising research towards you know something that's always really fascinated me uh, communication and uh, i suppose the art of persuasion and had that always fascinated you in terms of the marketing yeah. prior to doing your masters yeah i had i'd always always been interested in advertising i remember um looking at and laughing at advertising uh and my dad who was always interested in it too um and we'd uh you know We'd, we'd always appreciate a very good uh, ad, and uh, you know there is there is a kind of a kind of art to it in a way, and we you know that that has always been something that I've I've enjoyed, and um, you know often you it's best to gravitate towards things that give you energy and that you find interesting in life um, and that hopefully you can make interesting for others. Yeah, absolutely. In previous episodes, I have talked about the arts as it as it compares to, say, what we would call creativity, I suppose, in advertising. Yeah. And in my mind, I've created, rightly or wrongly, this this kind of, maybe, maybe it's just semantics, but I've looked at art and creativity as more pure creativity, whereas advertising is, is, is more applied, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but what I find really interesting, certainly, and we'll come on to it in more detail later on in this talk, no doubt, is how you've managed to look at culture and the role that art plays. And you've created that parallel with advertising. Yeah. Because I'm mindful of pointing fingers only because I've done it a lot myself in the past and pointed fingers at the rise of, say, digital analytics and it's kind of taken our eye off the ball. Um, but your commentary seems to take a much broader uh, look at culture for answers. Yes, that's right. In both my books, I look back at uh, other periods of history and, you know, well, why would you do that, Orlando? Well, because often, you know, it's only by looking back that you can really understand the present. And I look at, in particular, the art, but, you know, the creative arts, in earlier periods of history and how art changes at certain times and how it reflects what's going on more broadly in culture. There's a lovely um, quote by Ruskin about, you know, something like the history of a, of a society is recorded in its, in its words, in its deeds and in its art, but the only truthful one of these is its art because it sort of reveals something that that is uh, that's going on that you know perhaps we we don't, we don't realize and so and i think advertising too can be and it looks very much like a barometer of what's happening more broadly in society and everything's kind of connected at least that's the way i see it and you know, advertising doesn't exist in a vacuum so it can tell us what's going on in the world but it can also you know what's going on in the world has a bearing on advertising the kind of advertising that's made, what it looks like, and also how well it works, and that's that's the other aspects of my books. Well, that's the key part, isn't it? I suppose as it as it manifests and as it translates to effectiveness. That's right. So I suppose on one side you've got that barometer to steal your word of, of art as a reflection of culture, and presumably that um, manifests in everything from. Uh, the the creative arts that you might associate with museums and galleries but also to popular yes. music for example oh very much so yeah but the one yeah, thing it I doesn't think... have is how well that actually achieves its objective actually is that a lie i'm making this up as i go orlando i'm thinking <laughs> in terms of the songs you could look at the popularity of music and then there's an effectiveness gauge there i suppose you could you could you, you could um, you could but, but you in could. terms of advertising and its ability to work so that's that's almost like a different variable you've added in yeah yeah well the the, the you know i mean that if you look back at art i mean if we just take two periods for instance which i think are very interesting the the uh period shortly after the invention of the printing presses which you know you probably have to look back that far to understand anything of the world today you know the invention of the internet 
very similar parallel. And, you know, the Reformation that came after the invention of the printing presses and the sort of fear and the the kind of, um, uh, you know, tales of, as I say in the book, you know, uh, of, of monstrous births and wondrous signs, you know, it's very much like fake news today. And this, uh, what happened in art was everything tended to go a bit flat and you got the pointing finger and you got the stare and you got a fixity and a solemnity and a stasis. And, um, you know, the word started to become prominent, you know, in art, more prominent than the actual, you know, the images. It was as if the, the images were only really there to serve the words that were on the surface of the canvas. Wow. That looks very much like a lot of advertising today. And when you look back at what happened after uh, the Reformation, you get this, um, I suppose, the Counter-Reformation. And what happened was, the, I suppose, the, the Catholic Church lent on the living and showing the living and relationships between people and stories and this sort of, um, you see it in the work of Caravaggio, you know, the, the people connecting, ordinary people connecting. It was a popular art that then sort of swept really across uh, Europe over the next hundred years or so and gave us some really wonderful uh, art, an art that connected at a very deep, a meaningful, personal level. And, uh, you know, that's, I think there are many lessons there for how we connect, you know, as, as advertisers uh, with the general public. I'm only now, as you say that, Orlando, realising why in the magnificent pool of guests that we've welcomed onto Call to Action, there are a significant portion of them who have studied history. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm only now, perhaps belatedly, <laughs> realizing how strong that parallel is or can be with marketing. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, the, the, those who uh, study history, I think, hopefully tend to have a, you know, a broader appreciation of, of things and, um, you know, like, like to understand it, to know what, what's going on at the moment. I think that's really important for any strategist or, or planner is to be able to draw on that. Um, and to use it and and use it to to communicate to tell stories and to you know to hopefully point to to a uh, you know a, a better way of doing things. I'm hoping that this might work as a nice nod into chatting briefly about lemon. But I wonder what it was about that um, historian in you that led you to not, for example, specialise and become an art historian, <laughs> but actually start becoming more of an advertising historian and I wonder if it is as simple as, as you and I think you said your dad would, would enjoy good ads on the telly growing up yeah it was it was that really I, I mean you know I, I've i always liked uh, drawing I've always liked art and in fact I do paint as your earlier question su you know as suggested um, but but I suppose it's, that's only really developed in me in recent years and so it wasn't it wasn't so much a love of that that got me into advertising research. Um, it's just that I think it's useful to be able to look at images because an image can tell you something and and explain something in very short order that lots of words you know, can't really. And so I think it's important to look at uh, the visual arts to try to explain, you know, what we're trying what we're really trying to say here. So yes, it's uh, it's something that, that I think is just useful and um, also elevates the craft of advertising. Absolutely. So can you summarise, and I'm, I'm always mindful of bringing people on who have uh, published great works and great studies of asking them to summarise something too briefly and then it's just been in a, a completely unfair request. But, but your book, Lemon, as the cover <laughs> note suggests, discusses about how what was once a dazzling art form has become more of a, a dreary science. Yeah. So can you give me a summary of, of, of how that changed and why that changed or why you conclude it's changed? Well, I suppose in the book, I look at, uh, I, I start by looking at, at, at what Peter Field observed, really, which was this decline in 
advertising effectiveness and creative effectiveness over the last 15, 20 years. And the, the rest of the book really is devoted to trying to understand, you know, what, why is this? And I look at things from a creative perspective. And I also look at things uh, drawing on the work of a neuroscientist, um, he's a philosopher too, really, psychologist called Ian McGilchrist, who looks at the uh, way that the brain pays attention to the world. In fact, my books really are, I suppose, describe the um, the intersection between between creativity and attention and the nature of our attention. But anyway, in this book, I draw on Ian's work, which we can perhaps come on to in a moment, to explain and to show how advertising has become quite flat and mechanistic, reliant on the word on the screen, uh, has become a bit divorced from time and place, so we often don't know where ads are set, when they're set, uh, they've lost a sense of lived time, so you often see short, sharp cuts. And you uh, get a, a very rhythmic kind of set of images put before you, often against a rhythmic soundtrack. And it all feels and looks a bit self-conscious, as if it's trying a bit too hard. Look at me, look at me. Um, and this is quite different from the style of advertising that we used to see a great deal more of. I mean, it still exists, of course, but we used to see advertising that had people in a defined location, often with a sense of depth, um, and you have people talking to each other in dialogue, communicating, like little sketches almost, often with humor, um, with metaphor, uh, with music, as opposed to simple rhythmic soundtracks, and uh, all unfolding in live time with what I might describe as character, incident, and place. And that kind of advertising you see much less of today. And it struck me, you know, one evening when I was watching a TV ad break before I wrote Lemon, having read Ian McGilchrist's work and been reflecting on it and thinking about it, more of which in a moment, um, that it corresponded with his theories of how the brain pays attention to the world. And he describes how the left hemisphere of the brain, and by the way, they're both involved in all types of cognitive function. It's not that one does uh, something and the other one does something different. They both do important things all the time. It's just they have different modes of attention, different ways of looking at the world. And he describes how the left hemisphere tends to flatten things and how it doesn't, uh, it, it's not very good with people, with live time. It's very goal orientated. It likes to abstract things. And you see this quite a lot in advertising today. So we're really close up to things, just the hands, just the lips, just the mouth, perhaps. And it also it, it can't really understand music, only very basic rhythm. It's pretty literal in the way that it thinks, it thinks in terms of linear cause and effect. Um, it's pretty dogmatic as well. Anger lateralizes to the left hemisphere. So there were lots of things about the left hemisphere, which, you know, just looking at these ads, I thought, good grief, there's something, there's something in this, I think. And then the right hemisphere, which is the hemisphere which presents the world to us in the first place and helps us to understand context, the whole, everything around us, uh, the people in it, um, that brings a kind of broad beam attention as opposed to the sort of narrow beam attention of the left hemisphere. This, this broad beam attention helps us to understand gesture, character, um, movement, I suppose the uh, you know knowing glances between people, intonation, emphasis, the voice, accent, you know, all of the the implicit, if you like, and it helps us also to understand uh, live time. It helps us to understand and appreciate music. It helps us to understand depth. Um, and what what Ian talks about in his books is that how at certain times in history, you know, we tend to sort of veer towards this sort of um, bureaucratic 
technocratic left brain, if you like, uh, in the way that the culture unfolds. And you can see it in, in the art of a period. Uh, you can you can sort of, uh, in the thinking of a period. And I, I sort of thought, well, goodness, this is what's been happening to us. We've been becoming, you know, rather left brain dominant. And sure enough, when you look at a historical trace of advertising over the last 30 years or so, as I, as I do, you get this, you do see this swing towards this very close up mechanistic advertising from about 2006 onwards and a move away from this whole brained or, or right brained dominant advertising, I suppose, which by the way, costs a lot more money to create because of the actors and the people and the sets and the costumes and the, all of those things, the time needed to create it. And that has a bearing on uh, that, that sort of style, that shift in style has a bearing on the ability of an ad to uh, get noticed in the first place, to, to, to attract or capture our, our right brain's broad beam attention. And it also has a bearing on its ability to uh, c create an emotional response and to lodge the brand in memory as the right brain is much better connected to our limbic system, which helps us to feel something, but it also is better connected with our episodic memory, memory of people, places, events, you know, um, the real world, if you like. So so there, there are all sorts of things uh, happening in advertising which have um, made us move towards the style of advertising that looks more like performance advertising, really. And away from uh, the, the sort of demand, I, I suppose the new customer orientated brand building advertising, and that's really the subject of both of the books. Really, in in Lemon, I I look at it specifically from a from an, I suppose a, you know the the impact on emotional response, and in Lookout, I look at in more detail at attention, the nature of attention, and. Um, uh, you know, provide some, I think, you know, some suggestions, some answers, I hope, as to the type of advertising that that, that helps to drive profit. Yeah, I, I see them uh, perhaps more, the first lemon being more of a diagnosis and look out more of a prescription <laughs> in a way, in a sense. I think you're probably right. Yeah. Without trying to overly uh, simplify uh, something yes. that's far richer than yes. that. I really like the way you talk about the different hemispheres and the reason I in particular want to pick you up on that is I, I heard you, one of your talks, you use the word priority yes. um, in as much as left and right simply prioritise differently, yeah. which is really, it's only one word, but it does so much in positioning it as one of the same rather than I think there's a simple trap that people fall into easy, too easily where we think as things as completely separate entities. That's right. That's right. That's the idea of them prioritizing differently, I think it's key. In terms of the forces, obviously there's so many forces which have played a part in this uh, rise of uh, mechanistic advertising. Again, a nice term that you use. Is there anything to do? Well, how much has the actual media and the explosion of new forms and types of media played in, in almost not forcing? I don't think people should be necessarily blameless, but I'm also mindful of blaming people for running more say performance type ads because again if i nod back to you enjoying uh, great tv ads when you were growing up obviously there weren't smartphones and all types of different media forms which actually lend themselves to well or sorry don't lend themselves to that kind of attention rich media which tv typically would be yes i think there's um you know that really when you think about it there's been a bit of a narrowing of our attention you think how much time we spend looking down at our, um, uh, you know, at our, at our phones, and you how close up they are. Um, you know, the, uh, we're losing this sort of broad, broad beam attention. You know, which connects us with the person sitting next to us in the room. You know, the other family member sitting round the table often. So you, we we've sort of generally all of us, I think, become a bit more narrow beam in our attention. And when you get a technological advance like this, like the internet um, and all the things that have, you know, developed as a result of it, you tend to, you know, promote the habits of thinking that are better associated with, with I suppose, manipulating that tool 
uh, getting the most out of that tool. And so a kind of engineering and more direct mindset starts to emerge, you know, in, in society, in business. And one that is, uh, that, you know, I think you could see in earlier, earlier periods in history, you know, happening 1500s. But I think you can see it happening again today. And by the way, I think you could also see something similar happen to advertising in the 1950s. I've just been reading quite a lot, actually, about uh, advertising in the 1950s and what happened in the Creative Revolution. And it was very much a period of scientific advertising. Everyone, well, many people, you know, most people started to talk about advertising as a, as a science that could be, you know, that could be defined precisely. And it all came from mail order, you know, coupon type research, which was pretty narrow and direct when you think about it. And how many people are going to, you know, redeem a coupon are going to buy something as a result of this one ad that they have seen. That's sort of science's way of doing things. It narrows things down to a small, um, you know, sort of a linear mechanism. This has an effect on this, you know, when in fact there was, a, there was also a different uh, type of advertising, even then that people talked about a more general kind of advertising that wasn't focused so much on the immediate sale, but on uh, 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 attracting new customers. And that um, is what we might call brand building advertising today, uh, advertising for, for new, uh, creating new, and future demand, and that, so so that 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 was um, that was quite interesting because it, it because advertising had become in the fifties rather repetitive and monotonous, and it was uh, you know really like a, a product brochure, you know telling people about the product, very product focused, and then you know you get people like Bill Burnback and uh, come along, and suddenly uh, advertising looks at the product through the, the audience's eyes and as, you know, does something to, to, to get their ear, if you like, to make them look and read on. And you know, that, that shift, you know, I sort of wonder what might be required to do that again, because I think we've become very product centric. You know, that, I mean, at the heart of the difference between these two styles of, of advertising, which, you know, were existent then and they still exist today, I think because of the nature of the, of the brain and the way that we look at the world, you know, there is, um, uh, uh, there, there is this sort of difference between this narrow beam advertising for narrow beam attention, which drives sales for those in the market right now for the product, but which already assumes some kind of interest in the category or the, uh, you know, you're probably already in the buying window for this thing. And then there's a sort of advertising which assumes no inherent interest for the product, but seeks to create interest in the brand and the product to lodge it in memory for a uh, for those in the market now, but also for those who might not be in the market, perhaps quite for the next, you know, few months or the next year or next two years. So that that the different way of thinking about advertising, the broad and the broad beam attention I talk about in Lookout, the brand building advertising, and then this narrow beam, narrow cast uh, advertising for the immediate sale. I believe, but I might be wrong. Was it not in the fifties where? Is it James? I think it was James Vickery. Was it Vickery who 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 had that um, big claim around marketing and advertising being subliminal? I th I'm sure it was the fifties where oh, you flashed up buy this or drink coke. Or we're talking about Vance Packard and the hidden hidden persuaders, right? Yes. Um, yeah. But, well, there was a lot of a lot of science uh, around at the time. I mean, Ross Reeves and his USP. It's where the USB came from. Believed in you know, scientific advertising and worked with scientists to arrive at a, a, a unique selling proposition for brands that he worked on. There was also, you know, motivational researchers at the time. And, uh, you know, Vance Packard starts to talk about the hidden persuaders, you know, that, that people are manipulating us. 
And so, in a way, there were there were various lines of defence for this. That Paul Feldwick calls it, I think, the, the 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 benign conspiracy. But there was this, there was you know, it, it, there, there's nothing hidden about it. Rosa Reeves would say it operates in the in the bare and pitiless sunlight. Um, you know, and then you've got you've got Bill Birnbach saying it's not a science, it's an art, um, and you know, there's some sort of magic uh, to it, which people went along with. Um, because it was a, you know, it was a helpful. I mean, it was, it, I mean, I think I think it was probably right in many ways, but you know, it's it's a helpful way of thinking about it. So yes, there was a slight detour there, but yeah, that, that that's 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 right, that's right. And I wonder how much it's it, it is a back and forth. I mean, obviously, we have got to say this with the caveat that advertising is relatively well, it's not even young; it's it's an infant, really. I mean, it's what a century old, perhaps. But the fact there was a time during the late forties and fifties where you did have the the hidden persuaders or, or this James um, chap looking at it and trying to conclude that it was a lot more logical, perhaps, and and, and more uh, familiar with engineering than it is the arts. And then you had a, the, that golden age that people often refer to of the Birnbach era, where it did go completely the other end of the yeah. the, the scale, and it perhaps has gone back again due to the rise in maybe media formats and society and all sorts of other factors and perhaps we're seeing it going back again so it's not a case of it happening repeatedly but maybe it's happened twice yeah i think well you know uh, it's it it's uh, sometimes you you swing from the the hierarchical uh you know the the the, the that was something I mean, the 1950s were everyone knew their place in business and in society there was this hierarchical structure um top down uh you know things were all about manufacturing and time and motion studies all this sort of thing which is a very left brain way of looking at the world really and you know necessary but but it does tend to stifle uh, uh individual thought and autonomy and you get the you know and the, and then you move into this more carnivalesque type style of advertising uh, in the 60s and the 70s and over here I think in the UK CDP BMP you know various others uh, led the way in the UK um to, you know which which understood the need to entertain um and to be interesting uh in perhaps you need to interest people in a press ad and if you want to if you're running a TV ad you need to entertain um because what they are reading or what people are watching in advertising terms has to be at least as interesting if not more uh more so than everything that surrounds it and that's the challenge really and it's still the challenge today even in social media and other newer uh channels how can you be more interesting than what than what surrounds you i also wonder if there's a a, a want for some people perhaps people who are more left than right who want it to be more logical than it is yes i mean we spoke at length with paul feldrick when he came on the podcast and and, you know i'm a huge fan of paul's and his books and i think that the barclay card ads that he was so heavily involved in remain remain some of my favorite brilliant ads of all time with rowan atkinson yeah uh, starring um but it's funny isn't it the idea that entertaining is almost uh, sneered at by by some people as being a uh, I don't know do they see it's a cheap way frivolous. Perhaps. We had we had we had a comedian on um, Charlie Russell who's part of the brilliant uh, Goes Wrong shows which have appeared on the BBC for a few years running now around Christmas time, and she said there's a similar sentiment in their industry where if your if your preferred uh, type of comedy is slapstick which theirs is, there's, people look down on that as well. And I've always thought there's a slight parallel with with, yes. with her world and our world where you see like you're almost cheating. It's not as terrible. Yes, so, no, we need, come on, let's be serious. I mean, there is a, um, there's a wonderful G.K. Chesterton quote, which is something like this. Um, Humor gets in under the door while seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. <laughs> and that, is so true in life and in in advertising. It's a wonderful quote. It is, isn't it? Um, and uh, it, it it it's you know humor is humor is very much like advertising as as um, you know many have commented. And um, Jeremy Bullmore, I think, said you know that that humor reveals 
something to you. Well, so does advertising. Advertising's task is to reveal something to you. Not necessarily to tell you something, although a certain kind of advertising works that way, but for you to to draw something out of it. And there's a there's a lovely Howard Gossage quote, which is uh, you know, when you're when you're um uh baiting the trap with cheese, leave some room for the mouse. <laughs> Because, you know, you've got to let the audience do something themselves, fill in the gaps, to sort of watch what's happening and interpret what they're seeing and to make sense of the whole. You know, I think that's a really important lesson, particularly for the the type of advertising we call as brand building advertising, but the sort of advertising that, that actually results in the greatest profit growth more likelihood to greater likelihood to to drive profit share gain price reductions in price sensitivity all those really good things uh, it requires someone to you know the audience to take take on board uh what's going on and and to you know sort of understand it and 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 want and want to be part of it you have to think as jeremy bullmore said of your audience you know as an accomplice rather than someone you're communicating at yes yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about um studying history. There's um the late great Jeremy Bullmore. I mean, I've I've, I've been long obsessed with that man's brain. Um and I spoke about him uh, specifically when I spoke to Mark Ritson a few months ago actually, and I did make the point that it surprises and probably depresses me in equal measure how many young practitioners of marketing I speak to who, are, who, who aren't even th- familiar with his name. I mean, Howard Luck Rossage has always had that issue, I suppose. Yes. Um, sadly, he's like a you know a missing member of the Beatles in some regards. Yes, yes, exactly. No, I mean, the, the, and Guy Howard, I mean, Jeremy Bullmore, brilliant mind thinker, his essays and, uh, you know, I mean, just really worth anyone who hasn't come across them uh, reading. Um, Howard Gossage too, very interesting um, person, and you know, thought it was unethical uh, of uh, advertisers not to try to involve the audience, and that you have to, you know, you have to get the audience to do something, um, and that, and that, I think is 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 so relevant today. We interrupt this podcast to announce that we will never interrupt this podcast with ads. Ads that awkwardly nudge you to contact the pod's host, Charles Edwards, on 01189 952 007. Only the other day, some pod listening companies did just that, calling for guidance on strategy and brand identity. But we're not asking you to do that. Nope. Anyway, back to the show. And finally, brand purpose. Let's talk a little bit about brand purpose. What a load of fucking nonsense brand purpose is, yeah? Oh, the godfather of marketing, Mark Ritson, telling it like it is. Not what we were after. Hang on. Absolutely. I'm slightly mindful <coughs> of, uh, of time, Orlando, and I know that I would quite happily keep you for hours and hours, but I think I must uh, regretfully move on to listener questions. <laughs> Please do. Please do. I um well we're on the subject of change in a, in in some respects and I've kind of hinted at the maybe the pendulum is swinging back um, and I hope it is I, I I it troubles me I won't lie it troubles me um, the fact that we've I've run a small independent agency for almost fourteen years now and I I believe genuinely that I have seen change in that time um, but it does still trouble me that we are armed with so much wonderful evidence yours included but even going back to you know, the great um, Field and Burnett and all sorts of luminaries in, in this industry who have been fighting the fight far better than I could. And I find it frustrating that that hasn't seemingly swung the pendulum further, <laughs> further towards. Yes, because it's all there. The more we know about that, the and best, you know, uh, the less we seem to be doing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right thing, as Paul Feldwick says. Right. Yeah. So anyway, list of questions. So asking the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger, but that's not stopped us asking. So as usual, we've got two for you, Orlando, starting with Rebecca. Um, it's along the similar lines of, of what we've been discussing, but I'm, but I'm sure you might have more to elaborate. Rebecca says, your book Lemon highlighted that advertising is facing a crisis of creativity. 
a few years on from writing it, has anything changed and has it changed for better or for worse? Very difficult question. Um, in Lookout, I trace, you know, I, fo- I continue the the analysis and it seemed to be, things seem to be getting worse, if anything, um, which is a very depressing notion. Um, but, you know, I just, sen- I just sense in conversations and some of the work that's that's emerging that maybe maybe things are you know maybe things aren't quite as as mechanistic as they were and that you know some and there are some you know some very encouraging signs i think and certainly the people i speak to uh the marketeers i speak to um as well as as well as agencies uh seem very supportive and 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 a very um you know very keen to hear more about it so uh, you know i'm 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 hopeful i'm hopeful yeah but it is um it is tricky because i think that this way of thinking about communication doesn't come naturally perhaps to in particular uh tech orientated companies um you know where the, the the i suppose the the product and the newness of the product is is absolutely central and that you know that that if 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 you know you just you simply by communicating that um you've done your job and i think there is a you know there's um a misunderstanding perhaps of what the brand is and what it does and why it's important and that's a job that we uh you know we need to keep keep doing yeah, good answer. I was only a couple of rows back at the Festival of Marketing for your talk with oh, uh, yes. a huge, huge friend of the show, Dr. Grace Kites. Yes, Grace, yes. And I'm I'm gonna quote Grace here, not to try not to try and contradict you, although I'm mindful that this might come across that way, but yeah. I have a photo uh, of this particular moment and slide where she said if 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 there ever was a crisis, it's over. Yes. Um I, I, I mean, we were we were both on stage to put a, a different point of view uh, from each other. I think yes. And um, Grace was uh, pointing to her own analysis of ROI and how that had been, you know, on the up uh, in recent years. Now I'm, I'm, I think it might be a little bit too early to put the flags out just yet. I was making the point that actually. If you focus on ROI, well, that you know, as, as many others have said, ROI is a is a is you know shows you how efficient your advertising has been, and you know leads you towards the sort of low hanging fruit, the here and now, and uh, it could be that that as I said, we're both right. I mean, might both be wrong. Or- one of us <laughs> might be wrong, but but that you know that she uh, she's if she if you're looking at ROI as as your measure, then it could well be that you're prioritizing uh, you know shorter term returns, and you know with the rise in performance and left brain dominant advertising, it could be that ROI is improving, um, but you know when you look at longer term measures share of market gain you know relative to extra share of voice and what you'd expect to see as peter field points out these broader measures on you know the the ability of advertising to grow your share as opposed to just its ability to harvest sales you know this is this is these are different things and that that is pointing to a more alarming picture yeah, very well clarified as well. Question two is actually from Gasp's newest signing, uh, John Ly- John Lyons. Ah, yes, very good. Uh, he, he got a question in. So he John says, "I love the way Orlando describes adverts, more like an art historian describing one of the great paintings." <laughs> Go figure, John. <laughs> that makes sense now. Yeah. Uh, so, what is your favourite painting, and how would you describe his, which is Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh? Oh gosh! Wow. Um, well, let me try and try and tackle mine first, which is very difficult. Um, I think I might go for Caspar um, David Friedrich's *The Wanderer*, which is in *Lemon*, actually, which is just the 
the back of this uh, man standing on the top of a mountain looking out and there is a uh, there are sort of mists on the mountain tops and there's just a sense of being kind of at, at connected with the world but also um you know there's a sort of sense of awe and wonder to the whole thing which is very much of the romantic period depth height um you know the sort of visual the visual visually indistinct think of you know any turner and uh, painting which is very interesting to the i think to the right hemisphere but it's something that that you know i i think i particularly appreciate um so that would be my uh, choice, although there are many, many others I could go for. Is that why this uh, particular painting got a full page printer? I'm just looking at <laughs> Yeah, well, probably. Probably. Yeah, you've probably got it there. I'm looking at it now. You know, the, the, also the, the romantic period was one where the artist was the hero. Um, you know, it was a, it was sort of, um, I, I suppose, a bit like the what creatives became in the 1960s. Um you know, there, there's something, there's something, you know, very romantic. I mean, it defines romanticism really. That that painting. So, so very, it's very interesting. So, a starry night. Well, that's a very good question. Um, yes, everything is slightly distorted, isn't it? As I recall, uh, you know, the light, the um, the swirling, the swirling light. I'm trying to think of it, you know, from memory. And there's something a bit strange happening in that painting. And uh, yes, I mean, sort of reflects, I think, Van Gogh's state of state of mind, perhaps when he painted it. So I don't know. I guess it's very difficult. I mean, it's quite, it's quite an, it, you know, it's quite an arresting painting, isn't it? But I can't. I, I'm not. I think I'd probably have to have a proper look at it to have it to. to um, to remind myself, but uh, but yeah, I can I can see why it's appealing. Yes, I didn't Leo Burnett build a a, a room based on Starry Night for you know, I think they did. Yeah, I think, I they, think did. they did. I think they did. It's it's funny actually. I wonder, and again, I could be way off here, Orlando, but I wonder if art critics, or certainly criticism that art often faces, is also a good example of left and right hemisphere. Because yeah, which is I I could have cut a shark in half and suspended it in glass. It's probably a comment that's been said a few times. And the fact is, well, you probably couldn't, and you didn't. <laughs> yes, that's well, that's the main difference, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I think there is a there is a with critics of film or of art. Uh, going back to our earlier conversation, actually, there is this need to sort of um, post rationalise things. And, and there is a there is a, a a kind of a preference and the prioritization of the cerebral over things that uh, make you feel something. I think you see it in film critics uh, in particular, uh, possibly even in music criticism as well. But there is this this uh, this sort of more analytical mind uh, and a post rationalizing sort of justification mind that that can somehow that, that I think you probably you might also controversially see it he said um in awards advertising awards as well um you know that the, the the humorous um is ignored uh, uh, uh but you know actually it's much more difficult to make something that's popular than it is to make something that only appeals to a very narrow proportion of the population um and i think that the the, tr- the the trick and the responsibility is as uh, i think sir hugh weldon said who was the uh, md of the bbc head of you know programming and all those things in the 60s and 70s is to make the good popular and the popular good <laughs> um and that is uh, that's the challenge uh, i think yeah another great quote <laughs> and the final part of the interview, then Orlando, is our four pertinent poses that we put to all of our guests. Uh, number one being, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh goodness! Well, uh, yeah, I think you probably have to figure things out for yourself. But if I were if I were to go back, I would probably say, 
go where you find the energy and and spend the time with the people who give you the energy. Um, be yourself only more so um, because there's a lovely Birnbach quote actually, which is um, to succeed an ad or a person or a product for that matter must establish its own unique personality or it will never stand out. So be yourself only more so. Um, and then I've also just, you know, remember that as he also said, by the way, nobody's perfect and nobody will ever believe you if you claim to be. So I think some, you know, they're, they're worth worth bearing in mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Be yourself only more so is brilliant. And actually, I, I mean, we might have had something along similar lines before, but I, we certainly haven't had that come up. And it's immediately reminded me of a course, an IPA course I did about eight years ago. And that was def that definitely came up in the course. And it was all about it how to, um, what was it about? It was, it, it, it was, it was loosely about, leading being a leader within a, within yeah. a business um which yes i mean you know we're all of some of our experiences aren't we and our and our uh, personality and i think you have to you have to draw on that uh to bring people with you in your communication style in uh in all that you do yes yeah well said well said uh, number two if you could banish one thing from the industry what would it be and why uh i would say uh the word content, the word content, because I think it uh, demeans and uh, it it reduces what uh, reduces the craft of advertising, and it makes it and it prioritizes the pipe work that surrounds the content. It's just stuff you put through the pipes, you know. So I would probably ban that term because uh, I think it, it's it's not it's not very helpful. <laughs> no, not at all. That's brilliant. Prioritizes the pipe work. I'm stealing that, Orlando. The other <laughs> the other point on that I've stolen from the great. Um, I suppose it's been quite marmite in a way, but I, I really admire Bob Hoffman. Oh yeah, and he wrote a few years ago about let's just call content shit. And his point was in you know in particularly typically uh, blunt Bob form. But his point was was really smart, and he said, if if the, if there's something great, uh, whether it's um, the Wanderer, Starry Night, whatever it might be, we call yeah. it a painting. If there's a yeah. you know, great film, we call it a movie. There's if something's not great, it's content, and he, and it was really cool. He yes. was like, if something is really good and valuable and worthy of your time, then we actually we're quite specific with how we talk about it. Whereas That's content, right. it's almost become a power. It also suggests, you know, it also suggests that we're. You know, we're just making stuff to fill the machine, um, and it and it ha it gives a and it's also a view of marketing that suggests that they're just the coloring in department. You know, I'll go make some content type thing rather than something that can create demand and interest and inbound inquiry, all of those things. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah and that delivers real value as well. Yeah, business exactly. Value. value creation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you look at how much these big big businesses sell for. A key part of that is going to be the brand and the IP, isn't it? And that's certainly yes. rarely created by content and pipe work. Yeah. Um, aside from Lemon and Lookout, which we've linked to in this episode's uh, listing, are there any books that you can recommend to our listeners? Oh, wow. They don't have to be work-related, I must add. They can yeah. be. Um... Well, I'm, I'm um, as I said, I've been reading quite a lot about uh, advertising and uh, in the you know, in the fifties and sixties and, and beyond. And, um, so there's one book that I've been reading recently, which I think is very interesting. And that's called Madison Avenue USA, which was written in 1958. And it just talks about how different people at the time felt, thought that advertising worked, which I think is very interesting. Um, and I've also been looking at, uh, when advertising tried harder by Larry Dobro. Dobro, um, which is which you know is full of these wonderful sort of full page ads because I think it's so important to look at the work, you know, and how it works. You know, go to many conferences today, you barely see an ad. It's all about measurement. It's all about you know media strategy. You know, there's very little focus on the work itself. So I think so. That's a lovely book, um, and also. Uh, 
uh, there's there's a there's a book that's just been written about uh, CDP called Methods of the Mad Men by Mike Everett, who was at CDP, who I, I know Mike, um, which I think is just a, a very interesting book about the different campaigns that they ran and the stories behind them and how they came about and sometimes the remarkable you know remarkable craft that went into them. So I think that's that they're they're all. If you're interested in advertising history and and you know advertising of that period, I think they're all all definitely worth a read, and you know still have still have resonance today. Yeah, absolutely, great. Well, we'll link to those books too. Uh, number four, then we we always dedicate every episode to someone, and we bestow or hospital pass that honor depending on your view to our guest. He has to give sure, their yeah. reason why. So would you kindly dedicate this episode? Oh gosh, well there are so many people who've um, you know shown support and encouragement and to me it's really difficult this one and uh, but I think it's going to be to someone who you know I've kind of my career has been intertwined with his for many years and um, of eighteen years we've worked together I think it would be to John Kieran who uh, first employed me at his company um, founder of System One. This is going to sound very sycophantic, but you know, I genuinely have learned so much from his way of approaching problems, uh, situations, people, and he's just been hugely supportive to me um, throughout. So um, that's my. Uh, I dedicate this to John if he's listening. Um, uh, it's to you, John. There you go. Brilliant. Well, this episode is very proudly dedicated to John Kieran. Fantastic. So as a final call to action, everything we've discussed will be listed or is listed, I should say. Um, we will include links to Madison Avenue USA, to Advertising Tried Harder, Methods of the Mad Men, of course, Lemon and Lookout, which Orlando tells me um, the man to thank for its beautiful aesthetic is a, is a man called Gr Grant Morrison. That's right. He was a designer, yes. And, and, and the covers were done by... Um by Adrian Holmes and John O'Driscoll. Um, right. So, yeah, yeah. It was a many, many, many job, many people on the, on the job. <laughs> oh, no, no doubt, no doubt. Well, it's good, to, it's good to give them all give them all a nod, but we do implore everybody to uh, to buy the books. Uh, thank you for, well, thank you for bringing up so many wonderful names who I don't, I still think sadly don't get celebrated enough. So Howard Luck Gossage, the late, great Jeremy Bullmore, Bill Burnback, um, humour can get in under the door while seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. Thank you for that, uh, Chiki Chesterton quote. That's an absolute belter. Um, but Orlando, I'm 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 blissfully aware that we probably haven't had the time to give your books the uh, you know the credit they deserve uh, during what is a relatively short conversation. So, can you advise how best people can get access to those books and also? how else they can get more Orlando Wood yes well um, Lemon and Lookout are both available on Amazon um, if you are an IPA member uh, then you can get them at uh, at a discount actually uh, from the IPA direct uh, they are the publisher the IPA and uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn um, there is more Orlando coming in different guises I've got a couple of new creative projects uh, on the go at the moment and uh, hoping to be uh, appearing at a number of conferences and events in the next six months so um, come and say hello uh, if you uh, if you if you see me wonderful perfect well thank you Orlando I've enjoyed this even more than I knew I would and it's been a real privilege to talk absolute pleasure thanks very much and finally thank you to everyone listening if you've enjoyed this episode please do share and review the pod keep your questions and guest requests coming in to get in touch it's easy to find gasp online or just email hello at calltoaction.co
Yeah! <laughs>